Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of History After Hours podcast. My name is Kevin Pumphrey, and with me, as always, is Mr. Ron Franklin. And today is another special episode because we are live at Collective Coffee and Tea in downtown Hot Springs, Arkansas, where tons of our students showed up and asked a bunch of very interesting questions. This is one of our best podcasts. And one reason for that is we have a very special guest on this podcast, Mrs. Kimberly Van Meter, and she is one of our fellow teachers who is in the English department, and it was great having her on. I'm sure she will be on uh, other episodes as they come up, and so a big thank you to her, a big thank you to Collective Coffee and all the students who showed up to ask these great questions. You can follow History After Hours on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, and we're on Spotify now. And so follow us, give us suggestions, give us topics, tweet about it. We definitely appreciate you guys. And once again, we just love talking about all sorts of topics through the lens of history. And without further ado, please enjoy the podcast. Okay, we are at Collective Coffee and Tea in downtown Hot Springs, Arkansas. My name is Kevin Pumphrey, and with me is Mr. Ron Franklin. And today we have a special guest, one of our colleagues in the English department, Miss Kimberly Van Meter. So she's going to add a little style. All right. Yep, already more popular than us. So appreciate you get coming out. All right, so just like always, we have a bunch of students looking at us. And they're about to come to the microphone and ask a question. Look at all the hopeful anticipation on their faces. That's awesome. And here she is. The first brave soul. State your name for the record, please. Okay, my name's Julia Gallagher, and I want to know what you think would happen near Saudi Arabia and Russia if we stopped using oil. If we, the United States, stopped using oil? Like everyone. Oh, everyone. Yeah. Well, Russia buys most of its oil from other people, so... Yeah, I think, I think we have kind of a misunderstanding about where most of our oil comes from, but obviously you're talking about how OPEC control, controls oil prices. Oh, that's a little complicated. No, jump um, in. There's, well, I'm just saying there's oil available from other countries. They would just have to either not be a part of OPEC, withdraw from OPEC, or not give in to OPEC pressure to raise prices. And so kind of a touchy issue. I wouldn't want to get into that kind of... Um, contest with them, but we have options. I just, I don't think I could predict how that would go down. I don't know what kind of guts we have. We don't actually get most of our oil from the Middle East. I think most of you know that, right? Do you know where we get it? Venezuela. Venezuela. I mean, we get it from South America. There's, there pl- there's plenty of reserves for oil in other places, but they control the market, and so that's the issue. Anybody got anything to add to that? Well, I would say one, um, one thing that is occurring right now that I think is going to be in the long run bad for us is we are scared to death of nuclear energy, and that Chernobyl series probably didn't help anything, but we're running away from this energy, which is clean, no emissions, pretty cost. Uh, right now, it, it, it could we really sh- that's something we should be going towards because the Middle East, the power that they do wage, comes from oil. And if you take that away from them, one way or another, they lose their power over other countries that maybe are a little bit better willed. All right, so let me jump in and ask this question to you guys, then we can think about it. Uh, Because part of what she's talking about is the cause and effect if we stop relying on oil. Are we as good of friends with Saudi Arabia if we stop depending on any of their oil and we watch them sort of wither, perhaps, because their entire economy is based on that one that one thing. They don't have tourism. They don't have industry other than what we have here. So would we continue to be friends with them? I'm going to say yes, and that's because of Israel more specifically than anything else, and a counterbalance to Iran. So I think that even if they didn't have that oil revenue, we would need to come through and help support them. I, I think yes, too, in that way, but I also think we'd be setting ourselves up, maybe not the immediately, but in the long term for a pretty major disaster when it came to our Middle Eastern relationship. But you're right, the Israel factor does have a lot to do with how things have to stay balanced. The only true democracy in the area, I mean, we've got to support that. 
Hey, I will give a random bonus point to a random person. First one to come to the mic to tell me what OPEC stands for. <laughs> Everybody grabs a phone. No, wait. All right. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, here comes someone. Okay. I need all the points I can get. Say your name. Wait, you said OPEC, right? O OPEC. Not yeah, opaque. O opaque. Yeah, opaque. What we've been talking about. Oh, opaque. No, yeah. Opaque. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> all right, one. All right, one. No, 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 come back. Come back. No, come back. No, come back. <laughs> Originally I postulating a confusion. Tell me everyone. what opaque means then. <laughs> Since you brought it up. Come on. You, you set yourself up. Opaque means you can't see through it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. I don't know what opaque means. Yeah. Excellent. I'll give you a half a point credit in somebody's class other than mine. Harvard you, could you, be listening right you, now. That's the guy. That's you the work one. that out. I'll, I'll vouch for you. Okay. No, seriously. Anybody? That point is still available. Who knows what? Oh, you got the... Okay. Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries. Nice. Yeah. What's your name so we can give you the point? I got it. You didn't say your name. Oh, yeah. You didn't say your name. Abby Poole. Okay. Very good. All right. Very good. All right. All right. Who's got another question? Good question, by the way. Nice. Yeah. Good to begin with something serious. All like right. Um, I'm Zeta Guzmanacha, and I got two questions. Okay. First of all, uh, Mr. Pumphrey, do you mind, us, mind giving us the answers to the next <laughs> test? <laughs> yes, I, I will give them now. It's either A, B, C, or D on every question. All right, uh, all right. For tomorrow. Thank you. And <coughs> since it's the spooky month, I was wondering. <laughs> spooky month? <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you think the strangest thing that occurred in history? Oh, my gosh. In all of human history. Uh, all right, so let me... You know, Trump is president. I don't know if you've heard. <laughs> <laughs> How much longer? We're not sure. We're not sure, but that was a strange, strange thing. That is a, yeah. Okay, side note. Do you know that Congress is right now uh, pondering whether or not they should change the name of October to match the other months? They want to change it to October. There's a movement to change it to October. September, October, November, December. That's what they want to do. Boo. Yeah. Who likes that? Not me. Or Boo. No. Yeah, I'm completely lying. That's not a thing. It's, it's Praise God. Just wanted to see how gullible you are. Strangest thing in history, guys. Come on. Strangest thing in history. Um, um, I, I'd say the creepiest fact in American history is the two signers of the Declaration the only two signers of the Declaration that also became president, that were really close, died on the same day, July 4th, on the 50th anniversary of the signing, 1826. That's, that's the creepiest. John Adams and Thomas and Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, yeah. That's, that's pretty creepy. creepy. Um, I, there's got to be something. I, I, this isn't historical, but I think zombie ants are creepy. That doesn't have anything to do with anything. You think what? Zombie ants. They're zombie ants? They're ants that are like zombies because they've been infected with this chemical that another bug gives them and they kind of go around. It's crazy and they infect their whole colony and it kills a bunch of ants, but they're like the walking dead. I think those are creepy, but that's not a historical thing. That's the only thing that comes to I mind. I really thought zombie, like ants and uncles. Zombie ants, they're <laughs> the worst. What? I'm zombies, sorry. you know, like seniors before test time. Yes, like that. Okay. Uh, I, God, that's a, that's so difficult. I um, think there's like Bermuda I'm gonna Triangle say, stuff. I'm gonna say me. any cult ever, right? Jim Jones. Oh, yeah, that Jonestown. was a Jonestown. Gonna, yeah, Jonestown. That's pretty creepy. creepy. That's real creepy. Super creepy. If you don't know anything about the J the uh, Jonestown South American debacle, like when we that say up. we don't drink the Kool Aid, we're alluding to Jonestown. Yeah. I'm not drinking your Kool Aid. Yeah. I mean, I've never, I've always wondered how some guy walks up to you and goes, um, by the way, I'm the new Jesus. And people go, oh, really? Yeah. Ooh, we should give you all our stuff. And we're going to go hide from the American government. And by the way, they're coming. Yeah, yeah. Please give this Kool-Aid to your kids so you can die before they get here. Do you here. know that he convinced people that he was performing miracles? That he, he uh, somebody, like he got shot apparently, supposedly. And then he came back and he healed himself. And they're like, oh my God, he is Jesus. Yeah. He is Jesus. Jim Jones Jesus. See how it works? Yeah. He was pretty crazy. Triple J. All right. Come on up. Good question, Connor. Hey. All right. Say, um, say your name. My say name is name. Connor Johnson, uh, and I'm wondering, uh, I'm wanting a list of the top three worst presidents in history. So far. Okay. So present company. Ex um, 
Yeah, it's too early to judge. There's been some bad ones. I'll uh, say uh, Andrew Johnson, James Buchanan, and uh, I don't know, Grover. No, 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 um, Garfield. Was he, Andrew Johnson one of the ones that was they attempted impeachment? Or yeah. Was, okay. Johnson. He's I don't right remember. after. Uh, Buchanan and Johnson both bookshelf Lincoln, and then Garfield. Actually, William Henry Harrison, who only served like six weeks, and he died of pneumonia. And y- you got to throw him in there because he refused to wear a top hat and coat in the rain during his inauguration. The idiot. poor man caught the flu yeah. at 69 years old. and He did died. that to prove how strong he was. Look how virile I am, and then he died. Okay, that was interesting. So irony. I don't actually have an opinion on who the worst presidents are because I, my, I was born under Lyndon B. Johnson, so I don't remember him. Um, and all I remember is Nixon and how awful that was. So that always makes the top of my list. But I wasn't a huge fan of Carter. I didn't have a huge yeah. opinion about him. And right now, Few I'm withholding were. judgment until history has made its decisions. So. I'm going to jump forward and say President Jeezy. <laughs> yeah. Kanye, 2020. Yeah. Nobody. Yeah. Yeah. I think he would be a horrible president. Wait, but you know. He's doing gospel music now. Get off his back. Yeah, well, that just leads to the cult thing we were talking about before, so I don't know. No one man should have all <laughs> that power. <laughs> hey. All right. Yeah. All right. Next. All right. Come on up. Howdy. Hey. So as, uh, as educators and parents, I want to know, do you think that people are born with creativity, or do you think it has to do with uh, more of the nurturing and... <laughs> And parenting side of it. I, Let I, me have this one. I'm sensing, I'm okay. sensing some enthusiasm from our guest. Yes. Did yes. somebody plant that on you? Because that's like no, my soapbox. I, I mean, it was okay, you are all born with creativity. You are all born with it. Now, we may have variances and levels of it. The problem is not whether or not you're born creative. The problem is whether or not it's ever inspired in you. The problem is whether or not you ever take that creativity and do something with it. If you would get off your social media every once in a while, read a book, watch something other than stupid, listen to something other than lame, you might actually get somewhere. You are brilliant. That is what the United States of America is great for. We are not great because of test scores that are arbitrarily compared with other countries. We are great because the world owes us creativity. I'm not done. I'm not done. I think education should inspire creativity in every human being. I think you should maintain that desire your entire life. Stop settling. This is the age you're supposed to rebel against that that staid little miserable existence and start creating something for yourself that is brilliant and beautiful. You are born creative. Don't let anybody kill it. So, so when you all walk out of class tomorrow and protest against the system that's keeping you down, we'll know who to thank for that inspiration. I'll go down with you. <laughs> hey, I'll go down. I've got to agree. Uh, Our public school slash factory system that we've created yes. is like it's good at beating creativity out of people, my class included. Um, because we're part of a system we can't redesign. We're getting paid by the system, just like your parents and other people. So there's tons of kids that we teach and that I see at school that have a intelligence that's not measured by the metrics we use in public yes. schools. So if you don't make great grades and you're not, you're not like your friends that understand all this stuff, that doesn't, has no really um, measure on who you are and your intelligence level, creativity, and the stuff that you could be good at that the school is just bad at recognizing, including my class. Yes. Once again, I teach to a specific type, but just there's words for... Hey, let, all right, well, let me say this, because just because... You are in a system like ours that has structure that you can't escape for a while. That doesn't mean that you can't go out on your own and practice being creative. You, you will get good at what you practice doing in life. If you practice being stupid, you will get great at being stupid. If you, get pra- if you practice being lazy, then you'll get great at being that. If you practice procrastination, then you will be excellent at procrastinating. If you practice over and over again trying to do something new, it will take a while and it might be, it might come easier to other people than to you, but if you will just work your ass off, it will happen for you. Amen. I'm married to a man who butchers the English language. In 23 years of he taking my class every year, he'd have never passed it. He once used the word hyperbolic and I nearly cried. 
because he actually used it correctly does in he context. Know the, does he know opaque? <laughs> he does know opaque. He knows a lot. The reason, the reason I'm passionate about this is because his love is rebuilding engines and transmissions. He can build any vehicle from the ground up, any house from the ground up. If it's broken, he can fix it. In school, he was stupid. In life, he's brilliant. And he's creative. He's a problem solver. That's what you guys need to celebrate, not just in yourselves. Stop being so snobbish and pedantic and let other people be good at what they're good at and celebrate that with them. Wow. I have a dream today. All right. All right. Pedantic is an excellent word. First time on this podcast. I'm First time sure. ever. We're not that smart. No, no, no. <laughs> All right, come on up there, buddy. Next question. Like I never is uh, uh, look, I haven't seen you in a while. Hey, there you go. All right. What's up? My man, Ethan. My name is Ethan Garner. It's good to see both you gentlemen again. And, uh, Thanks you for recognizing me, Ethan. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of big talk about creativity. I guess this question is going to be directed to you. Go for it. All right, I will um, back up. Why, why as people, as social cre creatures, are we attracted, uh, we are drawn to these creative, creative outlets like music or art? Why is that we, we can appreciate things and why, um, why we spend so much time doing them? So you're asking a, a philosophical question yeah, now, right? Not a biological question. Oh, yeah, um, whatever way you choose to take it. Well, okay, so we could, we could come up with a lot of whys. I could come from a spiritual angle. I could come from a sociological angle. I could come from a biological angle. I could talk about how we progressed, you know, as a people group. I don't have the answer except it's in us, and it is what we are. We are more than just our biology. We are more than just the sum of our parts. And these are the things that create beauty in the world. And naturally, we're attracted to beauty. So it fits. Yeah, there's. All right. <laughs> I mean, that's the best. I, I, we're on. unique creatures yeah. in that we, we look, if you look at a span of 10,000 years of human history, we're, we've been experiencing this electricity and all this very shortly. We think of it like I get pride in my work and I got to go to job and punch a clock and. But you understand most of human life has not been like that. It's been about being together, coming up with ideas, music, love, survival, yeah. these things that really, you know, we're pretty soft. We don't have to worry about a cougar jumping through this wall and getting it. We're very, we got our guard. But, you know, for most of human history, it was a lot, everything was more elevated sense-wise. And I think that fed in to this survival creativity thing that we still feel Somewhere in there. But well, there were still cave dwell, you know, drawings on cave dwelling walls, and there were still people making music. It's just, it's in our DNA. It's in us. We can't help it. It is another layer to who we are. And I would come from the spiritual aspect of it. I would actually accredit something outside myself, but it is part of what we are as human beings, and it makes us powerful. Do you think that in an age where we had less technology and less um, distraction from each other, that creativity was more vibrant. Be and here's what I mean by that. When you have to entertain yourself, when, if you're going to have music in your life, you're going to create it. If you're going to have art, then you're going to be the ones. If you're going to have family, like instead of all of this, we, we, we talk about connectivity, and yet we live these very sometimes isolated lives behind this screen. And I wonder if that's going to have an impact overall. Like people who break free from that, I think, tend to be more creative, not that you can't do both, but relying on yourself to do more for yourself, I think, hands-on, right? I think that's going to make a difference in the long run if we go back to that. Or if we don't, maybe we just end up like those Wally people, you know, floating on those little chairs, sucking down our milkshakes and looking at a screen. I mean, there, there's no creativity in that at all. Well, I, okay, so I have 12 grandchildren, and I notice the difference between my grandchildren and my children because my grandchildren actually get more screen time even from their strict parents and so when they have no screens they play together well and they do a better job interacting with each other when they have screens they're less creative so I think there's some validity to that um, it's also probably a cop-out because we could be creative even with this stuff as we know how to use it all right hey Very thank good. all three of you guys for your time thank you for asking thank the question thanks for coming Ethan. it's good to see you buddy I've still got your Yushanka by the way you need to come get it sometime Oh, ooh, sweet. <laughs> Very nice. I, you know what? Next time I will. If you come next time, I'll be wearing that thing. All right. It's a bar there you go. There you go. You're going to bring it? All right. I'll bring hats for everybody. Uh, quick announcement. We, well, two things. 
We are uh, currently now on iTunes, and you can catch the History After Hours podcast there on that platform just as of this moment. So, super cool. All right. My name is Will Ross. Hello, Will Ross. Um, a question specifically for Miss Van Meter, but um, y'all can answer it after she does first. Um, how do you feel about the quote, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often <laughs> rhymes? Okay, so this, this will... <laughs> so here's what happened. I was listening to NPR, and somebody said something about what's happening now with the presidential impeachment, and the statement was made that history doesn't, that Mark Twain once said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often, and I couldn't remember the rest of it. So I looked it up in front of him, so he's planting that. But let's just go with that. History doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. There's often a rhythm to it. So I'm actually not going to use history. I'm going to use you. I'm going to use your relationship So with your parents and with other adults. So one of the things that happens sociologically, anthropologically, however you want to say it, you guys are raised a certain way, sort of similarly, because of technology and some other things, affluence, et cetera, et cetera you will actually respond or react to your upbringing and you'll swing things another way when it comes to how you raise your children and that will swing again another way and we'll see this cycle. There is, if not a rhyme, definitely a rhythm to history, to watching how the generations sort of march to a beat that just kind of feeds off the last one. And a lot of times we'll complain, we'll say kids these days, they're so irresponsible, they're so disrespectful, they're so this, they're so that. First of all, I think most of you are awesome, but let's presume that that's the reputation your generation has. You'll raise your children differently. You will respond to your upbringing. You will recognize maybe my parents were too easy on me. Maybe they gave me too much. Hey, I got too much screen time. I'm not gonna do that to my kids. And you'll change that generation. So that's the rhyme, maybe the rhythm of it. Just kind of add to the point, anybody who I've ever heard say, you know, the world today is so terrible, it's going to hell in a handbasket, it's over now, it's any minute now, it's the end. So I was going to say, Socrates was the one I was going to bring up. Socrates was blamed for corrupting the youth, and everybody was like, oh my God, these kids are out of control. He's ruining our youth. They're they're going to ruin the world. Right, because he was teaching them to think, and they killed him for it, right? Imagine that, a teacher is executed for teaching people to think for themselves. You mean yeah, it's not, not being lockstep? Yeah, lockstep. right, the system, like we were talking about a while ago. Uh, I, the, rep, the repetition of history, because you don't get the exact same circumstance every single time, there are too many variables, exactly. but there are definitely patterns that we can see, and people, here's, here's what hooked me about history from the moment I sort of realized this, this point. You can, st- you can look most of what we talk about up in a book, but it doesn't mean that you make the connections and you understand why the things happened the way they exactly. did. Regardless of the, I mean, we think we're, we're very different than the ancient people. Folks, that's not true. We are the exact same. same. We're driven by the same desires, by the same fears, by the same hopes and needs. We are the same people and our experiences are the same that people had millennia ago and beyond and for millennia forward from us. Like the, the technology changes and the way you dress and the, and the way you interact may change and the, and the and the, and the inventiveness that we have around us is going to continue to enhance. But that does not change the human condition, not one single bit. What's in your heart has always been in your heart, and it always will be. With and that therefore, said, it repeats. let me push back just a second. I think we are in a unique time. And I say that because if you go before 1800, the average age was about 28 years old. And it wasn't because people only lived to 28. It's because tons of babies died. Very, you know, the infant mortality. And then we invented something called indoor plumbing, where we could take away our waste and have clean drinking water. When, we, when, we, when I hear people say, oh, I wish I lived in the, no, you don't. No, you don't. This is the best it's ever been. Have you ever had someone ask you that? If you could go back in history, where would you? I'm like, I ain't going back. <laughs> I didn't want to go back to the 70s, much less. There were some ancient societies. There were some ancient societies that knew Mm -hmm. about cleanliness, but I still probably wouldn't prefer that. No, no, vaccines. They didn't have AC Mm -hmm. and they didn't have vaccines. Oh, bro, climate control? That's that's how my list of luxuries in modern life. I'm not giving that up. When we talk about history repeating itself, usually we are looking at a pretty big sweep of history where people did, like you, you were born. And you did exactly what your parents do. You're a peasant on somewhere. And guess what? Your kids are fated to that life. We're in a different kind of interesting spot to see how this plays out in the future. 
So I don't know how much this, I, we still human at heart, right? We have the same desires that they did 100 years, 200 years ago. So it still will repeat. It just might be. I, I, well, it, it might repeat so. differently, but the, but the human condition really hasn't changed. Right. Like we all want love and we all want security and we all want to feel that we're special in a seven billion person world. You know, <laughs> you're unique, just like everyone else. Just like <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. So, but I mean, that's my point: is that the, what how we react to whatever condition we're faced with tends to be uh, predictable. And, and what happens is uh, it, the catalyst is what happens to us changes what happens to the next right, it's all cause generation, and, and it is predictable in many ways. And we can see those cycles, uh, albeit. I think it's expanding like rays instead of we maybe. We adapt pretty cycle. quick to whatever. Like we're just, this is normal. Cell phones, normal. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's just, it's, we're, we adapt pretty quick as humans. What, I wonder what technologies your kids will have that will irritate you. I think about that I all wonder the time. about that. Holograms. Because there'll be something. Holograms. Quit running through the walls. I can't wait for holograms. Why can't, why aren't there holograms in our lives right now? I don't know, but I tell my kids I was going to use like, them so I could talk to my grandkids. Oh, no, here's the thing. Creepiest thing that's ever happened? Hologram Michael Jackson. That freaks the crap out of me. <laughs> Creepy. Like that's why is that a thing? Okay, Thrill. come on up, hurry, hurry. Uh, oh, so, Miss Van Meter, last year you were talking about um, like writing for standardized tests and how that is timed, <gasps> and, and how there's you, not a. Did you say your name? Oh, I'm Savannah Godwin. For the Godwin. record, there you sorry. Go. Um, and how there's not a real life situation that that applies to. So, could you just talk about that? I can talk about that. So, one of my frustrations is that a lot, and we've already talked about that to some degree. A lot of what we do in education, guys, has no actual. There's nothing in reality that compares to it. For instance, time writings. If, if we're going to do that to writing, we're actually going to ruin writers, and we have in some ways. So I have kids. Yes, do you need to sometimes think quickly? Sure, if you're an EMT or you're a neurosurgeon and you've got a patient bleeding out or something like that. But when it comes to our thoughts, our thoughts are precious and they're valuable. And for us to just teach you to sort of rotely spit them out on paper in a time session without any opportunity to look at it, to think about it, to revise it, to, to sort of meditate even on it, which writing is communication. It's a permanent form of communication. It can be a beautiful form of communication and we have diminished it. And I'm not talking about technical manuals, that's a whole other thing. Obviously that kind of writing you know, is something that is just perfunctory and essential. But this, this kind of writing, to force you to do it in a time setting and not allow any of the, the movement and the motion that comes with real human communication, I think is a denigration of what we should be doing in education. And I hate it, if that's not clear enough. I say it all the time. Um, we have, we've, we're pretty good at preparing you for college, and that's kind of about it. Um, and unfortunately, we have a system where a school dominates your life you know, you play sports at school, all your friends are at school, and so you think school is the end all be all of what all you need to know. If you had me last year especially, and even this year you've probably seen it a little, where I'm talking about something that matters, and I have to actually go, okay, I gotta stop talking gotta about stop. stuff that matters. Let's talk about something that really, you really don't need to know, but here we go. Here's Andrew Jackson, um, you know, or whatever I'm talking about, because stuff you should know uh, is important. Although there is a class now, or a club, Called Future Generations. Right, right. Very good. Future Generations of America. FGA. And they're going to talk about stuff you really do need to know in order to survive that first few years after high school that we don't teach you at school. So please go there on Wednesdays in Mr. Nixon's room. Yep. Yeah, you could you can figure right. it out. October twenty third. All right, let me say this because we're harping down on systems quite a bit here. Yeah, we I think that uh, everything that you've said is true. But I will also add this. Folks in this room, those of you that, that go where we go and do what we do, I think that you're exceptionally blessed to be in a school with teachers like the three of us, and I will <laughs> include myself in that, no, nope, pat myself on the back, that care about your well-being and your mental state and the ability for you to think past a time test. But yes. are willing to make the effort to prepare you for that time test because yeah, we know it matters. Right. It's hard for us to do that sometimes, but that, we know it matters what you look like on paper sometimes. That part so. comes hand in hand with it, but I'm saying you can go other places where they just kind of go Don't through those care. motions, and we have an exceptional staff of people who care and are well-trained, well-prepared, take their stuff seriously, and want the best for you. Right? I've, I've taught at five schools. This is the best. So if you're at Lakeside, congratulations. You're doing Go well. Rams! <laughs> yeah. 
All right, shameless Next plug. Next question. Hi, my name is Abigail Webb. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Pumphrey. So I don't know if you've already said this in class, but how exactly do you want us to study for the test tomorrow? Because I'm really stressed out. I shouldn't have had a podcast the day before. Um, all you got to do is know everything in chapters one through nine. That's all. And you're good. Just know it all. It's STEM-based questions. Um, you'll get better at all of this as we move along. Don't worry. And there, you know, there might be a curve. We'll see. Make a Quizlet. Will Ross is really good at those. See, if How you were listening, Quizlet, you're Quizlet King. How should we prepare? Just blind faith. Just hope that you've got it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Get a goat, slaughter it, some hyssop, <laughs> you're good to go. Yeah. Just pray to your favorite deity and hope for the best. All right, come on. Waste your time at a podcast. That's <laughs> what you should do instead of studying. Hi, I'm Hayes. But you got the point. I'd like... I'd like all three of you to answer this question. Um, okay. Yeah, I'd like all three of you to answer this question, but um, what is the most important book that each of you think that everyone should read? Like the one book. All right. Um, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna, I'm gonna set a, a, a parameter here, excluding religious texts. Yeah, cool. Okay. Well, if you're talking about your test tomorrow, the American Pageant 15th edition, I think, would be a good start. I'd get through Chapter 9. Uh, that's a good, important book for your life right now. Is that the best you can do? Well, to, to kill a well, mockingbird. I mean, also, The Sound and the Fury. But I'll just stick with To Kill a Mockingbird. Have you read, have you read the sequel? Because I haven't. Have you read it? Okay, no, do not read the sequel. Because apparently... It should never have been published. I actually ordered it, and then I heard all the press on she it. She didn't want it published. She didn't right? want it published, and it actually makes Atticus a, look really racist. And so I can't ruin Atticus. So To Kill a Mockingbird, it's got, it's got the historical context that many of you have gotten so far away from that I don't know that you're super familiar with that. All right, so um, tell, oh, tell the backstory on that. I'm just curious. Like, How did it become – why was it published? But it was published okay. after her death, right? So she didn't she want was it. in a nursing home. We're okay. talking about – uh, go Our set a watchman or set a watch. Like I don't know. So the the sequel, she was in a nursing home. She was apparently um, not quite in her right mind, maybe had right. aged, had some dementia. Not very lucid. Yeah, not very lucid. And the people that were responsible for her estate actually published it. She had said in interviews her entire life that To Kill a Mockingbird was the only book she ever wanted published. So when they... When they released that one, I had hoped that maybe she had changed her mind about an old manuscript, but that wasn't the case. And I bought it. I was so excited. My students would even, I would have, a, this was when I was still at Benton High School, and I would be really crabby. And my students learned to say, just remember that book's coming in, Miss V. That book's <laughs> coming in from Amazon. And so that was supposed to make me happy. And then it came in, and I read the press on it. I never read the book. I own it, but I didn't read it. Because I can't ruin my characters. I, I know the people in To Kill a Mockingbird. When Jem was nearly 12, he got his arm badly broken at the elbow when it healed his fears of never being able to play football again where switch. He was seldom self-conscious of his injury. I know the characters. I know the story. Um, I, I like the fact that um, we're seeing the reality of some things that people... The characterization is powerful. Calpurnia having to go to a side door instead of a front door in an emergency. Atticus being this Christ character has this terrible flaw and then he believes the best about everybody to the detriment and nearly the, the death of his own children. I could go on and on and on. Read To Kill a Mockingbird. If you've read it, read it again. If you had to read it for school, wait a while. Read it again when you don't have to read it for school. Read it again read it again her language is beautiful the description is beautiful and y'all are from small town south those of you who are born and raised here and those of you who are here now welcome and you need to know about what your grandparents and your great-grandparents what they're experiencing in some of the ways that they react to other human beings and the why they react the way they react and I could start talking about racism and we'd be here all night but read to kill a mockingbird I'm gonna shut up now you going to follow that? Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> I got to go read To Kill a Mockingbird tonight. <laughs> they, they forced us to read that in the eighth grade, and I hated it. I hated it because I was forced to read it. And when I went back later, and I was like, oh, um, this is brilliant. Right? But you, it, but you have to absorb it differently. So that's another sort of downside. Yeah, and I think she makes a good point. Reading stuff again, at different ages, things hit you differently. So something you're forced to read in ninth grade 
and then you become 30, it's a different thing. So, yeah, some of those classics are always awesome. All right. Do you have one? I've already, oh, yeah, well. No, you didn't. I just got you through reading um, That's not an answer. Some, a really good book. Look, I, I don't have, like, the one book you should read because there's been so many that's kind of, you know, worked me this way. Art of War. Sun Tzu. That's really not. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a kind of a newer book out called Enlightenment Now by Stephen Pinker who, because everything is gloom and doom and we're all going to die, and I was kind of like that with AI and technology, and I still can. I am like that. But that is an optimistic book about the future, and it actually kind of looks back at history and says, look how far we've come. And it's a pretty good book to read if you're into uh, positivity and looking how far we've come. Um, Dr. Seuss's Oh, the Places You'll Go. No, I'm kidding. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> actually, <That's not laughs> it's not a bad book, book it's actually. Okay, one. but it's not my answer. Um, all right, I've got two. One that's above most people's heads, and I'm not... I'm not uh, criticizing you, just most people just can't approach it, yeah. Uh, Dante Alighieri wrote a book called The Divine Comedy, and it's broken into three separate books, Inferno, Purgatorio, and the Paradiso. You have to understand a little bit of history, that's probably why I like it so much. But let me say this about it. I've never read another book that I could feel as deeply as I did there. The, the darkness and the horrid aspect of the depths of hell itself in Inferno are frightening as they were intended to be. Uh, the, the purgatory element is also pretty freaking scary. It's not a place of like rest and relaxation as you kind of wait for your ticket to go to heaven. You're also being punished and there's a, I mean, there's a lot of commentary about why that is. But then when you come out of that darkness and you start to feel elevated a bit when they reach the peak where they're about to launch over into heaven and he's going to meet these great prophets from the past and these people who were, who were uh, martyred for their faith. And then as he elevates up to the moment where he's about to see the face of God himself, I, and this is not an exaggeration, as I was reading, I could see light in wow. the back of my head. It was uplifting. It was incredible. I cannot picture another book that's ever made me feel exactly that way because it was that stretch from the darkness and the, and the misery all the way up to this. I actually felt light, and that's incredible. Two things. That helps stand, standardize the Italian language, correct? Yes, sir. And also our, um, some of our modern views about heaven, hell, and all that comes from that. Exactly. Imagery. A lot of images that people have in their heads are based on, uh, on retellings of that particular story. Uh, most of it's not biblical at all. He made it completely up. And the cool thing about it is that he was, he was actually so afraid to release that book that it wasn't published until after his death because he called so many people out, put them in places where they would have, I mean, he would have been, I think he would have been martyred himself <laughs> if he hadn't uh, waited until he was already dead to have somebody publish it. it it's, but it's a, it's a fantastic read. It's, it's a big book, and you've got to spend, you got to dedicate some time to it. But I cannot think of another book that's made me feel that way. And that goes back to what you guys were asking about. That's what writing is supposed to do. It's supposed to make you feel that way. And that's why I don't like the time writing situation, the way we treat it in school sometimes. Yeah. The, the only other one that's a little bit more approachable, I would say, there's a book by um, Barbara Kingsolver, and it is called um, The Poisonwood Bible. It's a lot more approachable. It deals with a lot of the, it deals with a lot of the things that you were talking about with To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, I have both those. I have both of those books in my personal library at school, and you're welcome to check either one of them out. All right, next question. we got time for a few more. Hi, my name is Adrian Steelman, and uh, my question is, do you think that you control your own fate, or is, like, the future set in stone? This would be a free will question. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Neurologists are working on this problem right now. I don't really have an opinion. So um... I don't believe in fate, so there you go. <laughs> so this sucks because I have a lot of opinions on this, and it's not gonna, none of it's gonna help. Right, you gotta condense because we're. No, uh, there's no way I can actually address right. this. So do I? I I so tend just to just say yes or no. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm going to say. <laughs> nice try, dude. <laughs> this may be the only time uh, I get to do this. I'm going to say that I actually. I believe more in personal choice than I do in fate. So I believe more, but. By the same token, I did not pick where I was born. I did not pick my genetics. I did not pick my parents. 
I did not pick these things. I won the birth lottery by being born in the United States of America. So I guess free will comes with whatever you're fated with, what do you do with it? So the, the two work together. What do you do with the chances you've been given? That's kind of the idea. Yeah, that's the free will that I'm talking about. Step up, sir. Uh, my name is Tao Jang, and my question is uh, milk and, uh, no wait, milk and cereal or cereal and milk? There's only one answer. Wait a minute, say that again. Uh, milk and cereal or cereal and milk? Cereal so and I, milk. I, I eat the cereal, then I drink the milk. <laughs> No? Yeah, there has the to be a right balance. So you put the cereal in first, then you add the milk, and mm. if you mess up, you put more cereal in. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that doesn't make sense. I agree. Cereal Are there milk. weirdos that do it yeah. the other <laughs> way? <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you a little of my brother's story. We used to, Saturday mornings, you guys don't know anything about Saturday morning cartoons. That was the only time of the week oh that we would get gosh. some sort of entertainment that wasn't, you know, you watch self-made. You yeah, you we would get, I mean, I would complain. I would bitch in, mom, my mother would come get me. She's in the audience, by the way. She would come and get me up, and she would say, it's time for bed, uh, it's time for school, get up, get up. And I was like, ah, zombie boy dragging out. But, and that was like 7 o'clock, I think. But 5.45 on Saturday morning, boy, I was awake, and we're ready to go, son. Turn that TV on, and it's not actually on at that, back in the 70s. Okay, here's a little Back in the 70s, there used to be times when TV didn't actually come on when you flip the switch. Like you could flip it and you get a little thing and then you'd have to like wait and wait and wait and wait with anticipation it would build and then suddenly the thing would come on and they'd play the national anthem and then next thing you know, Bugs Bunny Roadrunner time, baby. Yeah, for hours and we'd just sit there. My brother and I would get these big bowls of cereal and everything we want to do, we'd just camp out right there in front of the TV just as close as we could get. Getting all that good radiation to warm you up in the day. Uh, but okay, so the cereal part is my brother would get the biggest bowl he could find and then pour an entire box of Captain Crunch in it and then push it down and then pour the milk and it'd spill out, you know? And then, yeah, and then chew that and put it in there. It's like a little guess. Anyway, that's my story. Yeah. All right, go. Okay, my name is Lauren Freeman. It's kind of a stupid question, but what's the first vine or meme that comes to your mind? Meme? I like Cam Newton memes, so that's the only thing that comes to mind right now. I saw, I, I, I showed this in class earlier, I think, or maybe it was last year, I don't know. There's always this meme, it's for you really, it says world history and what is it, one sentence, and it's a bunch of Native Americans pointing and saying <laughs> those white people those look white dangerous. <laughs> 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 what them white boys want? Yeah, that pretty sums it up. I like that one. That's a pretty good one. Yeah. Uh, I, I've learned to appreciate, I teach art history this year for the first time, and wow. I've really, my daughter turned to me, uh, she was like, hey, look at the art history memes. Kill me, they're so awesome. Look some, just type it in, art history memes. And if you take art history, you kind of know what's going on. It's a bit funnier. I love some memes, come on up. I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate to be old enough to appreciate dank memes, so thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Okay, my name's Carly Orr, and I was wondering when is it okay to break the law, if ever? <laughs> Uh, yeah. Are you planning on a life of crime? <laughs> <laughs> so you so I punish? won't name any names. Is your but father here? Does he know <laughs> to ask that question? I am related to people who are breaking the law right now, and I know people who are breaking the law right now because they are illegally in other countries as missionaries. And so we would argue that it's okay to break the law at that time. Um, I could probably just talk about some other things, but that's the first one that comes to mind. So I guess it has to do, if you have a moral imperative, a moral belief that is higher than the law, you could argue that, but that gets a little hinky when you start applying that on uh, a daily level. So, yeah, tough call. Laws are not divine. They were exactly. man-made like anything, so you, it's a personal... Isn't that interesting where we talk about, um, we go back in history and we think about, well, God set the laws and then man follows the laws, and they use that a lot to control the people in the population. Exactly. That's just sort oh, of a yeah. historical thing. And then you have to figure out if you want to challenge that or not, and... You know, what will that mean for you eternally? So if I'm late for school, it's okay to break the law because I am speeding, girl. I am speeding. Yeah. But I'll also pay that ticket if they stop me. You can ask them. They can all tell you. I've written lots of checks. Right. Hello. So my name is Mari Ford, and with all this speak on creativity and how it's being stifled, what do you think, as educators, is the best way to keep that creativity going and to this make sure that's still there when we get out of the school systems. Anybody? Yeah, go well, ahead. you, I mean, just like anything else, you have to spend time at it. You have to 
whatever creativity means to you, you have to think through those things. You've got to purposefully put some effort into it. Um, you know, creativity means a different things to different people. Uh, right. So I can't define that for you, but I think you have to make effort towards it just like you do anything else, just like schoolwork. Uh, yeah. I would jump in and say, Mari, yeah. I would say that you're not that far away from being released from the institution of which you've been a part for a long time, and the moment you realize that you're free to make your own decisions, then you can do whatever you want to with the creativity that you have developed and will continue to develop. So it's, it's you, we think about high school transition to wherever, and that's more meaningful than you realize. The moment you realize that you can just wake up and do whatever it is that you actually want to do, like that's a liberating moment in people's lives. It, it, some people, I think, really don't experience it the same way, though. Right? You already do a lot of creative things that most of the people in here do. Schools don't always recognize the, uh, the different aspects of creativity, and we don't have the time or the, the room on the schedule to to create those places for you to do it, but you can create them for yourself. So the, the moment I knew I was an adult, my, this is, I, we were actually married, and we, uh, we're, I don't know if we had kids at that point or not, but we were sitting around and we were like, man, you know what sounds really good? We, we I, it's like Thanksgiving, like, but it was like J July. I was like, man, turkey and, and uh, stuff, it sounds really good. And then we both looked at each other and we're like, you know, we don't have to wait. It's like we can just do it. Like we're adults. We can actually make And so we do. We actually make it uh, what we call a half Thanksgiving. We do it in July with our friends. We have the whole big thing. We just do the whole schmear. And then people go, well, it's not halfway to Thanksgiving. I go, no, it's the first half of the meal. See, but, that's, but you, can just do, you can do crazy crap like that, though, because you just can. And that's kind of creative, right? So let, me, let me say this just as a caveat real quick. Because it sounds like we're kind of preaching anarchy and don't do your homework and all that. Just be creative. It's, that's all that matters. That's right. T burn it down. My, my, my dad used to do really hard work, grew up on a dairy farm, and he goes, I do what I have to do so I can do what I want to do exactly. later. So you still have to play the game. We still have this game yeah. in society. So Yeah, you need to work. You know, you got to make sure that you're doing your responsibilities, but then also be creative when we, you can. We Syst all work for the man. Listen, yeah. syst we're systems a cog in the wheel, so don't, you know. Systems exist for a reason, but they can be expanded and be more inclusive. All right, go. My name is Aiden Rose. I remember a while back in class, Mr. Pumphrey said something like, the oh, nuclear no. bomb was the first thing we'd invented that could actually destroy society, and it got me thinking, what all do you think we've invented since or are doing now that we could destroy ourselves with? What else besides the bomb? Yeah. Um, AI. Well, I, you, you love the AI. Uh, I mean, that's not here yet, but that's no, a potential. O overuse of uh, antibiotics? I mean, oh, definitely. overuse of antibiotics could be one. Uh, of course, uh, the, what, the way what we've done to the environment could one day catch up with us. Climate change. So we, but some of that stuff is still out there. I make a, a comparison that. We have ping pongs in this vase. You can pull them out, but you can't put them in. And since the beginning of mankind, and each ping pong represents an idea or an invention or something, and we're pulling them out. We've always pulled them out as fast as we can. And when we pulled out the nuclear one, it was black because it had the potential to destroy us all. And you just never know when you're going to reach in and get that next black ping pong. I, I'm, I'm, but I don't know. I'm more worried about a pandemic. Seriously, they're yeah, just out of control than I am, but nuclear or whatever. Take all your antibiotics, p yeah. people, when they prescribe them. And don't take antibiotics unless it's actually bacterial. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We look back on history and judge name. how things... Name, 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 oh, name. Lauren Boston. Thank you. We look back on history and judge how things were done in the past. What do you think the future will judge us for? Pumphrey, you cannot say Trump. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I wouldn't think that. Uh, I think there's going to be some good come out of all this. I think... An obvious one that hits me is factory farming. I think some future generations might look back and go, you could have done that a different way. Just like we look back. I mean, environment stuff. Mm, maybe the fact that, oh, I'll kind of go along with factory farming a little bit, but specifically factory farming of animals. Like the, 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 the mechanism that drives our food industry is actually pretty heinous if you look into it deeply. Uh, the with, I mean, <laughs> industrializing animal, uh, raising and then food production. Like it's pretty vile actually. Yeah. So maybe that. So I'm gonna say we're the most obviously advanced generation to date. We are the most aware of things that are happening. 
um, and our complacency. Um, we have the ability to change things, not just for ourselves, but for the disenfranchised, the marginalized, the hurting across the entire planet if we wanted to. And we're such pol polarized jerks sometimes that we don't get anything accomplished. So I, I think that's probably something that we will be, and I know that's broad, but yeah. I think that's something that history will look back and say, y'all could have done something about this. And, and that includes what they're talking about, Here, but you didn't. Here's one thing that's interesting, and I know this sounds moronic to say, but sometime in the distance futures, the way we've divided these countries and we have these borders and we're, that might be, they might look back and go, well, that was weird, right? You yeah. couldn't cross this imaginary line and you're a different thing. Yeah, have you ever, have you ever really pressed that point in class that everything on that map is just arbitrary? I mean, it's there are rivers, there are mountains, but, and there are coastlines. But really, everything else is just like, it, it's not really a thing. Because somebody just decided and defended. Like, we have international waters. There's places where it's not a big, but no, not, this is ours. But you better be careful. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so it's, right. uh, awesome. I don't know. Uh, my name is Yvonne Rodriguez, and I was just wondering if y'all were catching up on the case against Amber Geiger, the policeman yes, who yes. fatally shot right. her neighbor mm -hmm. on accident and got 10 years only right. for the murder. So I was thinking, what were your Are you thoughts? asking about the trial or the sentencing? What are you asking? Mm. All of this, it. All of it. <laughs> just what okay. are your thoughts about it? The are sentencing, so what, everything. What was the last thing that did... I, can't, I remember I saw something, some news story about it recently. Yeah, I'm in the same she boat. Just, I haven't seen anything recently. She just, all right, so this police officer in Dallas came home late, went to the wrong floor. Right. She opened the door. It, I don't know why it was open where she could get in, but it was. She opens the door, sees a guy on a couch, and he's sitting there eating ice cream, apparently. <laughs> and she's like, oh, my God, there's a guy broken into my apartment eating my ice cream. And she told him to freeze something, something. He didn't respond because he did, was confused. And she shot him, shot him right in the heart, and he, and he died. Yeah. Right, so and then she's like, oh, my God. And she's instantly freaking out knowing that she had done the wrong thing. So anyway, her defense was, because she's been charged with murder, uh, I was confused. I had worked a long day. I, I, was, I had tunnel vision, whatever, whatever. It was a complete mistake. And, okay, so long story short, she was convicted yesterday, I think. Two days ago. Two days ago, and then she was sentenced yesterday. Yeah. She could have gotten life in prison. They only gave her 10 years. She could be out in five with, uh, with a, a ch for a parole. Yeah. Um, so I, I, d I don't think that I'm sorry I was confused is a great argument for her. And obviously the jury felt the same way. I was confused about the, the extra leniency on the sentencing though. Like, uh, uh, she didn't mean to, that's probably true. But she did intend to kill him and she admitted that in court. Right. Just because you were confused, like that man sitting in his house, right? You do have a right to be in your house eating your own ice cream without fear of, of uh, you know, anybody's intervention in that. And so, I, I mean, on one hand, I feel sorry that it happened yeah. to, for, for both sides. But at the same time, like a chick deserves to go to prison for a lot longer than 10 years or five maybe, you know? That's just my opinion. I, th I think these are complicated issues yeah. with stuff like Text training. Te texts have also come. Jobs. Her previous texts have also come out showing that she has kind of a racist past. Oh, so was he? Black? Oh, I didn't know yeah, that. I was didn't. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mention that. But I thought sorry, you guys knew. Yeah, he, she, was she was white. white he, was he was black. black. Right. Yeah. So that a guy that named does both change them, John. the picture of the situation, yeah. especially right. if she has a racist attitude. Dallas cops have not had a good history of well, right in large cities around the country. I would suggest, well, in all cities around the country, there's been some yeah. issues. I actually, that's something that I've, I remember the initial event. I did not know. I think, did I see something about her, his brother? Yes. His Today, mm -hmm. his brother hugged her and said he forgave yes. her. So yeah. they're offering forgiveness, which does not change what the law should do in this situation. Right. So we've got a complicated issue. The law often judges intent, sometimes wisely, sometimes not so much. But did we need to send a message that people need to be more Freaking careful when they're they've got a loaded weapon. Yeah, probably. She admitted and that she so pointed the gun at him with intent to kill, yeah, and so he didn't I respond. Think that's maybe yeah. the issue, like it's if it's an accident and I kill somebody because I was careless, it doesn't matter that it was an accident. I'm not Someone's even, still gone. I'm not even sure that more training would have fixed that. Right, that was a personal decision that she made. Right. You don't realize that you're in the wrong house. You don't realize. And again, she was like tunnel vision. I was under stress. I thought he was there. I reacted instantly. I can see. I can see somebody making a mistake. But are you trained to shoot to kill? I mean, is that, apparently she was. 
Uh, apparently she was. And so that's something that may need to be looked at as well. Is, you know, what are the policies that may have led her to feel that that was the right, uh, the appropriate action to take? Yeah. I just, I don't know. I, I, it's, a, it's unfortunate. It's tragic, and I think. The, and the question remains, if they were both white or if they were both black, will be, we be even having the same conversation? Right, that's part of it. Which tells us something about our society yeah. and what we need to be looking at goes back to your To Kill a Mockingbird. It goes back to my To Kill a Mockingbird and the history of racism in our nation. That's a great question. Right. It is a great question. My name is Ann Grigsby, and so the Pope made it canon law to report sex abuse to the church rather than to police. Do you think that they could do a better job reprimanding them than the police? <laughs> oh, Lord Jesus, girl. Um, Sorry, God. Oh. No, that's a criminal offense, and it's it needs to be handled. period. End of yeah. discussion. Yeah. We're mandated reporters. If somebody's messing with you and I don't tell, I'm losing my job. The Pope ought to lose his too. And every priest that lets that happen, yes. And, by and the way, I love the Lord, but get them out of office if they do not. If you don't protect children, you have no business in that position. Period. And it. And sometimes we do a really good job of criticizing Christian religions and not. And we we're too careful with other religions because we don't want to. Yeah, that's a good point. I think that goes across the board for any religion yep. that has good this point. kind of thing going on and, or something And there similar. are others, but yeah, we don't have we're to familiar with our cultural context, and that's one I have no patience for Yeah, so for that's, uh, with all of the reforms that he's tried to put in place and, the, and the, some of the drastic changes he's actually made to call people out and to put them, you know, bring to, when, when was this? Did he say this recently? I don't know. Okay, the, the idea that, it's, that it's, uh, it's church business and we'll take care of that, like, that's a, that's a cop-out. I'm sorry. They've played that game for a long time. Uh, that doesn't sit well with me. Yeah, me neither. Sorry. Ooh, got me stirred up again. <laughs> uh, my yeah. name is Sarah Nutt, and uh, my question is, who do you think is the most overrated person in history? <laughs> <laughs> From the audience. Beyonce was Somebody. yelling. <laughs> Talk about my oh, Beyonce oh, like oh, that. Oh, oh, oh. Overrated <laughs> person in history. Overrated person. Um, Come on, historian. I'll tell you, presidents... I'll say, do you talking JFK? about politicians, or are we talking about just, just entertainers? Anyone. anyone. Just Genghis people. Con, I don't know. I mean, yeah. Alexander the Great. I don't know. See, the, you are, that is not a thing. <laughs> stick, <laughs> stick with literacy. <laughs> the dude, the dude died. Never mind. I'm not no, no, I mean, no, let's, no. Let's play this game out. Go ahead and say. No, it's okay. <laughs> I'm done. I'm I, re I really am. I, I am definitely swimming again. I, I, I will play this game I was game honestly just popping off names because I don't care. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm sure I would have liked Alex. Alexander the fairly okay. Fairly okay. Yeah. Since right, well, I'm a U.S. guy, I think uh, J. <laughs> he might have been. I think he might have been more on my list of great if he had lived longer. But now we can, Jesus didn't either. So we can Did argue. They both die at we can argue whether he deserves the great moniker or not. Like that's that's a different story. But I mean, to accomplish what he accomplished in the short amount of time I, he did, that's pretty. And impressive. the way he went about it, he yeah. was actually pretty clever. But he's a militant. Brutal dictator as well, and so yeah. you know. Did Alexander win or did the Persians lose? Let's be honest. Let's go. Ye <laughs> yes, that's both of those are true. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, no. Hi, my name is Evan Jordan. Um, what piece of or piece book philosophy, a piece or book or anything of philosophy has impacted you the most, and that you recite the most and you know praise the most as being the most accurate? To philosophy. Yeah, a philosophy. I said this today, do your best, it's always enough. Is that still some <laughs> Dr. Seuss? Are we going back to Dr. Seuss? I don't know. I said it a today person, to somebody. A person's a person, no matter how small. Um, Life is a lot like wrestling a gorilla. <laughs> you don't quit when you're tired. You quit when the gorilla's tired. <laughs> That's, I don't have a good philosophy. <laughs> I'm anto, 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 I'm tired, clearly. Anti-egoism. Egotism, whichever way you want to put it. Um, I'm not very nihilistic, so just working against those probably means a lot to me. But as far as something that's particularly inspired me. No, not for you, nothing? Maybe my brain's too tired. No, it's all right. Uh, for me, it's, I see a commonality with a lot of the philosophies, and we've, oh, we've studied a few of them. But the, the, the running, regardless of the facade that you put around it, regardless of how you dress it up, the core of every philosophy and every faith is finding some sort of middle path so that you can 
if avoid the extreme emotions one way or the other. I, I, don't, I mean, not that you can't be happy, not that you won't be sad, but the idea that you learn to deal with that in a, in a, in a, in a way that's efficient and effective so that you aren't hindering yourself and your own progress or other people around you. Like the idea that, that too much of anything can corrupt, but also too much little of th like too much less can hurt you as well, self-mortification. That's just another way of, a, of drawing attention to yourself, which is prideful and greedy, and therefore you need to avoid that. So the, the, anything that preaches the avoidance of greed, reaching out to other people, and they all do that in their own way. Like this, Thank we're, you, we're Freud. Part of a, we're part of a universal system, regardless of how you want to approach it. it they all lead to the same point. Just summarize the id, ego, and super ego mm -hmm. there. You are the ego. Awesome. <laughs> 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 Psychology 101. All right. Uh, also, thank oh. you, Miss Van Meter, for being the best teacher I've ever had. You're genuinely Yay. say that louder. I don't think yeah. everyone. <laughs> 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 um, thank well, you. I am. I am very grateful that you ended up in my class. It was wonderful. You. We'll have the editors put that on loop for you, so that you can, hear, so you can hear it over and over like a mantra. You can just don't, go don't to sleep that. to it every don't. night. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that right. concludes another hey, episode of awesome. History Thanks for joining us. Thank you to Miss Van Meter, and thanks to everybody who hung out here. Thank you, Collective Coffee, for having us once again, and we will see you guys on the flip-flop. Goodbye.